Discourse on Method, Etc., Etc., by Rene Descartes, Part 3. <clears throat> and finally, just as it is not enough, before beginning to rebuild the house where one is living, simply to pull it down and to make provision for materials and architects, and also to have carefully drawn up the building plans for it, but it is also necessary to be provided with some place else where one can live comfortably while working on it. So too, in order not to remain irresolute in my actions while reason required me to be so in my judgments, hang on, the dog walked in. And he's gone now. Pardon that. It is also necessary to be provided with some place else where one can comfortably live while working on it. So too, in order not to remain irresolute in my actions while reason required me to be so in my judgments, and in order not to cease to live as happily as possible during this time, I formulated a, provis a provisional code of morals, which consisted of but three or four maxims, which I very much want to share with you. The first was to obey the laws and the customs of my country, constantly holding on to the religion which, by God's grace, I had been instructed from my childhood, in governing myself and everything else according to the most moderate opinions and those furthest from excess, Opinions that were commonly accepted in practice by the most judicious of those with whom I would have to live. For, beginning from then on to count my own opinions as nothing because I wished to submit them all to examination, I was assured that I could not do better than to follow those of the most judicious. And although there may perhaps be people among the Persians or the Chinese just as judicious as there are among ourselves, it seemed to me that the most useful thing was to rule myself in accordance with those with whom I had to live, and that, in order to know what their opinions truly were, I ought to pay attention to what they did, rather than to what they said. Not only because in the corruption of our morals there are a few people who are willing to say everything they believe, but also because many do not know what they believe. For, given that the action of thought by which one believes something is different from that by which one knows that one believes it, the one often occurs without the other. And among many opinions that are equally accepted, I would choose only the most moderate, not only because they are always the most suitable for practical affairs and probably the best, every excess is usually bad, but also so as to stray less from the true path in case I should be mistaken than if I had chosen one of the two extremes when it was the other one I should have followed. And in particular, I counted among the excesses all the promises by which one curtails something of one's freedom. Not that I disapproved of laws that, to remedy the inconstancy of weak minds, permit someone, when he has a good plan or even for the security of commerce, some plan that is merely indifferent, to make vows or contracts that oblige him to persevere in it, but because I saw nothing in the world that always remained in the same state, and because, for my part, I promised myself to improve my judgments more and more and never to make them worse. I would have thought I committed a grave indiscretion against good sense if, having once approved of something, I had obliged myself to take it as good again later, when perhaps it might have stopped being so, or when I might have stopped considering it as such. My second maxim was to be as firm and resolute in my actions as I could, and to follow the most doubtful opinions once I had decided on them, with no less constancy than if they had been very well assured. In this, I would be imitating travelers who, finding themselves lost in some forest, should not wander about turning this way and that, nor, worse still, stop in one place, but should always walk in as straight a line as they can in one direction, and never change it for feeble reasons, even if, at the outset, it had perhaps been only chance that made them choose it. For by this means, even if they are not going exactly where they wish, at least they will eventually arrive somewhere, where they will probably be better off than in the middle of a forest. Thus the actions of life often hmm, and thus the actions of life often tolerating no delay, it is a very certain truth that, when it is not in our power to discern the truest opinions, we must follow the most probable, if even if we notice no more probability in some than others. Nevertheless, we must settle on some. And afterwards, no longer regard them as doubtful, insofar as they relate to practical matters. But it is very true and very certain, because the reason that made us decide on them appears so. And from then, 
And from then on, this was able to free me from all regret and remorse that usually agitate the consciences of those frail and irresolute minds that allow themselves inconstantly to go about treating as if good things they later judge to be bad. My third maxim was always to try to conquer myself rather than fortune, and to change my desires rather than the order of the world, and generally to accustom myself to believing that there is nothing that is completely within our power except our thoughts. So that, after we have done our best regarding things external to us, everything that is lacking for us to succeed is, from our point of view, absolutely impossible. And this alone seemed to me sufficient to prevent me in the future from despairing anything but excuse me, from desiring anything but what I was to actually acquire, and thus to make me content. For our will, tending by nature to desire only what our understanding represents to it as somehow possible, it is certain that, if we consider all the goods that are outside us as equally beyond our power, we will have no more regrets about lacking those that seem owed to us as our birthright, when we are deprived of them through no fault of our own, than we have in not possessing the kingdoms of China or Mexico and that, making a virtue of necessity, as they say, we shall no more desire to be healthy if we are sick, or to be free if we are in prison, then now do we have to make a body made out of diamonds, or wings to fly like birds. But I admit that long exercise is needed, as well as frequently repeated meditation, in order to become accustomed to looking at everything from this point of view, and I believe that it is principally in this that the secret of those philosophers consists who, in earlier times, were able to free themselves from fortune's domination, and who, despite sorrows and poverty, could rival their gods in happiness. For occupying themselves ceaselessly with considering the limits prescribed to them by nature, they so perfectly persuaded themselves that nothing was in their power but their thoughts, and this alone was sufficient to prevent them from having any affection for other things. And they controlled their thoughts so absolutely that in this they had some reason for reckoning themselves richer, more powerful, freer, and happier than any other men who, not having this philosophy, never thus controlled everything they wished to control, however favored by nature or fortune they might be. Finally, to conclude this code of morals, I took it upon myself to review the various occupations that men have in this life, in order to try to choose the best one. And, not wanting to say anything about the occupations of others, I thought I could not do better than to continue in that very one in which I found myself, that is to say, spending my whole life cultivating my reason and advancing, as far as I could, in the knowledge of the truth, following the method I had prescribed to myself. I had met with such extreme contentment since the time I had begun to make use of this method that I did not believe one could obtain any sweeter or more innocent contentment in this life and discovering every day by its means some truths that seemed to me quite important and commonly ignored by other people, the satisfaction I had from them so filled my mind that nothing else was of any consequence to me. In addition, the three preceding maxims were founded solely on the plan I had of continuing to instruct myself, for since God has given each of us some light to distinguish the true from the false, I would not have believed I ought to rest content for a single moment with merely the opinions of others, had I not proposed to use my own judgment to examine them when there would be time, and I would not have been able to free myself of scruples in following these opinions, had I not hoped that I would not, on that account, lose any opportunity of finding better ones, in case there were any. And finally, I could not have limited my desires or have been content, had I not followed a path by which, thinking I was assured of acquiring all the knowledge of which I was capable, I thought I was assured by the same means of this of the knowledge of all the true goods that would ever be in my power. <clears throat> For, given that our will tends not to pursue or flee anything unless our understanding represents it to the will as either good or bad, it suffices to judge well in order to do well, and to judge as best as one can, in order also to do one's very best, that is to say, to acquire all the virtues, and in general, all the other goods that one can acquire, and, when one is certain that this is the case, one could not fail to be contented. When I had thus assured myself of these maxims, and put them to one side along with the truth of faiths, which have always held first place among my beliefs, I judged that, as for the rest of my opinions, I could freely undertake to rid myself of them. 
and insomuch as I hope to be able to reach my goal better by conversing with men than by staying shut up any longer in the stove-heated room where I had all these thoughts. The winter was not yet over when I set out again on my travels. And in all the nine years that followed, I did nothing but wander here and there in the world, trying to, to be more a spectator than an actor in all the comedies that are played out there, and reflecting particularly... <sighs> phone. Okay, we good. In all the comedies that are played out there, and reflecting particularly in each matter on what might render it suspect and give us occasion for airing, I, meanwhile, rooted out from my mind all the errors that had previously been able to slip into it. Not that, in order to do this, I was imitating the skeptics, who doubt merely for the sake of doubting, and put on the affectation of being perpetually undecided, for, on the contrary, my entire plan tended simply to give me assurance, and to cast aside the shifting earth and sand, in order to find rock or clay. In this, I was quite successful, it seems to me, insomuch as trying to discover the falsity or the uncertainty of the propositions I was examining, not by feeble conjectures, but by clear and certain reasonings. I never found any that was so doubtful that I could not draw from it some quite certain conclusion, even if it had been merely that it contained nothing certain. And just as in tearing down an old house, one usually saves the wreckage for use in building a new one. Similarly, in destroying all those opinions of mine that I judged to be poorly founded, I made various observations and acquired many experiences that have since served me in establishing more certain opinions. Moreover, I continued to practice the method I had prescribed for myself, for, besides taking care generally to conduct all my thoughts according to its rules, from time to time <clears throat> I set aside some hours that I spent particularly in applying it to mathematical problems, or even also to some other problems that I could make as it were similar to those of mathematics, by detaching them from all the principles of the other sciences, which I did not find to be sufficiently firm, as you will see I have done in many problems that are explained in this volume. And thus, without living any differently in outward appearance than do those who, having no task but to live a sweet and innocent life, make a point of separating pleasures from vices, and who, in order to enjoy their leisure without becoming bored, involve themselves in all sorts of honest diversions, I did not cease to carry out my plan and to progress in the knowledge of the truth, perhaps more than if I had done nothing but read books or keep company with men of letters. Nevertheless, those nine years slipped by before I had a, as yet taken any stand regarding the difficulties commonly debated among learned men, or had begun to seek the foundations of any philosophy that was more certain than the commonly accepted one. <clears throat> and the example of many excellent minds, who had previously had this plan and had not, it seemed to me, succeeded in, to, in it, made me imagine so much difficulty in it, perhaps I would not have dared to undertake it so soon again, if I had not seen that some had already spread the rumor that I had achieved my goal. I cannot say on what they base this opinion, and if I have contributed something to it by my conversation, this must have been because I confess that of which I was ignorant more ingeniously than those who have studied only a little are in the habit of doing, and perhaps only because I showed the reasons I had for doubting many things that other people regard as certain, rather than because I was boasting of any learning. But having a good enough heart not to want someone to take me for something other than I was, I thought it necessary to try by every other means to render myself worthy of the reputation that was bestowed on me. And it is exactly eight years ago that this desire made me resolve to take my leave of all those places where I might have acquaintances, and to retire here, to a country where the long duration of the war has led to the establishment of such well-ordered discipline that the armies quartered here seem to serve only to make one enjoy the fruits of peace with even greater security, and where, in the midst of the crowd of a, a great and very busy people who are more concerned with their own affairs than they are curious about those of others, I have been able, without lacking any of the amenities to be found in the most bustling cities, to live as solitary and as withdrawn a life as I could in the most remotest deserts. End of part three.